bring you all greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus and uh, from Shenandoah. It is uh, good to be with you here this morning and share together uh, this sermon together. A kitchen table is a great place to gather and I'm hoping that you would all agree with that. Meal time would not be the same without a table prepared with food. Many, many precious memories that I have growing up all throughout my years of gathering together around the kitchen table. Sitting down to eat together uh, as a family is something that many families are not familiar with. Several weeks ago, we had the privilege of inviting a, a community couple coming to church for uh, a meal at our house, and they were amazed at this long extension table and a large gathering of people and all the food that comes and just the fellowship and, and the experience that I, I just have experienced all through my life. <clears throat> they were amazed at that. Good cooking and good food are so much better than fast food. Sitting down to a, a good meal Canning and filling the freezers are a blessing to have preparations for the year and the winter. Now, these are not salvation, and these are not, uh, I don't want to elevate these above uh, what I should, but this is something we, we need to be thankful for. And I start this sermon by <clears throat> giving you that picture of a kitchen table and all the blessings around a kitchen table. I want to encourage you to make that the best experience. Young families, uh, make the best of that time. <clears throat> we uh, are in a, <clears throat> a place where our family is uh, getting smaller. We have nine children, and there was a lot of uh, fullness and lots of food, and now it's going the other way. And that's okay until all the grandchildren come together, and then it's going to really get big again. But that's exciting, and I want to encourage you in that. But what I want to preach about this morning is the title of the sermon is God's Table, and I want to uh, do my best from the scripture to give you a picture of God's table. And we're going to uh, look at the Bible And hopefully encourage each of you in your walk with God and your relationship with God to experience time at God's table and uh, what it's like. And I'm not sure what for picture comes to your mind. I'd love to have all of you stand up and before I preach, just give you a chance. What are you seeing? When you picture now families getting together, we all, I think, connect. I see a lot of connection, and we understand. We have experienced that. We know what that's all about, and, and that's great. But what, what does God's table look like in your experience? I want to use a familiar psalm, and it's a psalm of David, one of the richest psalms that uh, many of us memorize. <clears throat> it is a very familiar psalm. And it's Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in Pass of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
So David was the one who wrote about God's table, and he said this, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Now, there's so much in this psalm, we could uh, spend a lot of time talking about the Lord as my shepherd, looking through the life of David and in our Sunday school. Yes, the Lord is my shepherd, and he's leading me. How many of you feel that the Lord is your shepherd, and he is leading you as one of his sheep? How many of you feel the, the green pastures and the still waters? And I'm not sure what you picture there, but the, the green pastures, sometimes those of us who have grew up on farms picture a knee-deep, knee-high uh, alfalfa field just walking out into a field of alfalfa that is ready to cut and just the best picture you can see and picture in your mind. That's how I used to picture this psalm, but that is so wrong. That's not what David was seeing. He was experiencing, and a trip to Israel will help you understand that, where you walk through barren Deserts, and then you come to uh, uh, a nice uh, patch of grass. And then the sheep eat, and then you go out into the desert again, and you're walking, and then the shepherd leads you to another. Just enough for today. Experience. And there's times when he allows us to lay down there. The green pastures and the still waters... How many of you feel like you need a little restoration? Anyone? He restores my soul and comes to restore and redeem and to help. David said, he restores my soul. And he found himself uh, restored and redeemed and made right. He found that. And the path of righteousness. Well, I want to talk about the table. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, if anybody could talk about enemies, David could. I don't know that any of us could stand up and share to the level even close of enemies that are out to to kill you and to stop you. That's not a a great way to live when you have enemies trying to kill you. And David could tell us all about that. He lived through that experience, enemies that uh, were all around him and living through that. And you can hear his heart cry through many, many of his psalms, his heart cry, God, hear my prayer. And deliver me. And being caught and feeling like he's he's caught in this uh, experience with no end in sight. Felt that way sometimes. But he says here that the Lord just prepared this table right in the presence of his enemies. Now we think sometimes... God's going to just wipe all our enemies away and God's on our side. He's going to get rid of all the enemies, right? He's going to clear the path before. He goes ahead of us clearing the path. The enemies are running and God's on our side and God is going to, to put an end to this. And sometimes we think that way, but really it wasn't that way at all. But rather the picture was that God, right in the middle of all of that, God put this table right in the presence of his enemies. And David experienced uh, communion with God. And he said that his cup is running over. So he experienced 
uh, God's grace in that experience. And goodness and mercy will follow him all the days of his life, and he will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so that's a little picture of the table. So the first point I have titled a table, uh, a prepared table, and I would like to picture this table is a table for two. Not so much a table like I described that we gather for the family together and a large table. That's coming. And I believe there are also the church experience is a, is a, a table experience somewhat where we come together collectively and we share life together and we worship together and we do a lot of things together in church life. So, so I believe we could uh, somewhat refer to that to a, a table as well. But I believe what David was talking about here was a table for two where he prepares a table for each one of us in our situations in life. Wherever we're going through, God has a table for you. And God has a table for me. And God has a table for everyone. And he wants us to sit down at that table. And he wants us to experience the table. He wants us to experience God's presence in a very real way. And I believe that this is uh, a picture of what a, a relationship with God should look like. No matter the circumstances in our life that we're called to go through and whatever we're going through in life, I believe that this table is there for all of us and it's more than enough. None of us can really say that we have it too bad and we have too many enemies or we have too many setbacks or we have too many things against us or whatever it is that we sometimes uh, will make excuses. But God has a table that is, is uh, sufficient. His grace is sufficient and the table is there for everyone. Our cups are running over, so what does your cup look like this morning? When David said his cup is flowing over, the picture there is it's full and running over and just flowing and flowing. It's running over. There's enough for me and enough for many more. So I believe that this is a picture of the abundant life that... Uh, God wants each, us, each of us to have. The abundant life in Christ is where God's grace and God's mercy is sufficient and we have a cup that's running over. We have God providing for our needs in, in every way. Goodness and mercy following you. <clears throat> I like that picture there. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I have goodness and mercy following you and a cup running over and a table prepared before our enemies or for us, before us, in the presence of our enemies. I believe that is enough and that's all that we need. He will lead us to the green pastures and the still waters. He will bring restoration to your soul. If you're here and you need restoration in your life, that's what the shepherd will do. He has his rod and he has his staff. Now the staff is to lead the sheep and the rod is to give us a, a whack when we need one. How many of you need a whack? The rod. You're not sure about that, and we don't like that rod, but yet the shepherd uses that staff and the rod, and he just prods us when we need it, and he, he brings restoration and change. And if there's something in our life that is, is uh, not right, the shepherd's there to help you get right. That's what the rod is all about, to keep the sheep in line.
for the table is prepared. <clears throat> Point number two, the table is in the presence of uh, all my enemies. Talked a little bit about this, but uh, we sometimes get the idea that uh, God's going to wipe away all of our enemies and those that speak evil against us are out to, to stop us. This is the very people that are out against Christianity. These are the very people that are trying to stop the work of the church. These are the people that hate God and hate you as a Christian and hate the very works of God. And there are those kind of people in the world. You all agree? There are enemies of the gospel in the world, and sometimes there's enemies of the gospel. Paul talks about enemies of the gospel who, hey, they love their own bellies, and they, they're about their own sinful practices. Sometimes they can get very close. Enemies of the gospel who really hate righteousness and love unrighteousness. Romans talks about the, the, uh, the days are coming when people will love unrighteousness and, and the lines between light and darkness, good and bad, will be blurred and there's many people who, who hate God. I believe we can relate to that more so than we can uh, in David's life, Saul and, and those that were really out to, to kill him and stop him. Whatever it is, if you run into someone who becomes an enemy to the cross of Christ or an enemy to your work and your ministry, it's not easy. I share the story of my years in Shenandoah, and there were, yes, those that opposed me. Moving into an area like that, I faced opposition and those that uh, didn't like me. One example, there was this man in town that uh, I met him many times, and one day we were talking, he said, you know, Pastor, I may as well admit to you right now that I've been lying about you. And I said, uh, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but you know, if you want to, <laughs> sure, let's clear it up. And he said, uh, there's, there's some, some men in town here that really want to hurt you. And I've been lying to them about you. I've been telling them that don't mess with that Mennonite preacher because he has a black belt in karate. And I was like, <laughs> after a bit, I don't care what anybody thinks about me anymore. So then I was wondering why all these people are running, because uh, every time I walk down the street, people are running away from me because I got a black belt in karate. But then after that, I began to think, you know, is there really some people that really do want to hurt me? And really, should I be concerned about this? Or should I trust the Lord? And I'm talking about enemies and those that are out to oppose. I have no idea to this day who, who they were. And, and uh, I'm just sharing the, the reality of, of enemies. They are real. When you are out into the work of God and getting into the dark areas of the world, and if you're involved in church planting and mission life in dark areas of the world, we need to pray for those people who hate God and hate Christians. The example of what happened to Christian Aid Ministries is just an example. Just, you would think and you would hope that would never happen to any one of us. It's always someone else, right? Right? People doing the work of God and people involved in the mission of the church and people involved in helping and people doing all the right things and suddenly this. Now I believe that this table is there for people like that, the Christian Aid Ministries and what they're going through, the ones that are held captive. How many of you believe that there's a table there? 
in the very presence of their enemies. And I would never wish that on anyone. And I would never wish that to happen to the church, but sometimes it does. And if you're ever in a place like that, always remember, always remember that God is is there. And that story is not over yet. We don't know how that will end and how that will come to a conclusion. But what I want to impress upon your minds and hearts is is that uh, God has you covered. And there is this table here for every one of us that I want you all to to experience and, and appreciate and be able to say as David did, God has a table for me. Life's going good, probably for most all of us. Life is good. And that's not the real test, but when things turn, that is the real test. Do you have this relationship with God, and do you know for sure that God has you covered? God has your back. It would be good for us, I believe, if, if God could take away open up our eyes into the, to the spiritual realm for just a little bit. I'm not sure how many of you would take the privilege to be able to see into the spiritual realm if you had that privilege. Sometimes, yeah, I think I'm strong enough and, and I think I would say, Lord, I'd like to see it. What are we really dealing with every day in this spiritual battle that's going on I would like to see the good side. I'm not sure I want to see the bad side, but it's real. And if God could open up our eyes and we could see into the spiritual realm, I see things like this. And around each one of our homes, I see angels just guarding our homes. I see God's protection all around uh, the Christians. Psalm says that uh, the angel of the Lord encamps round about those that fear him and delivers them. And so there you have the picture of the, the angels of God. I really believe that uh, that picture would be true when I walk through the town of Shenandoah and these evil men, that whoever they are, that want to hurt me, I believe, I believe there's, there's just an angelic realm that is around me all the time. It's important you understand and know and believe that. We are, we are on God's side, and God has us covered. Now, he doesn't always protect us from harm and danger, but he has this table before us. I believe if you would open up our eyes as well and see the, uh, the evil side, I believe uh, we would understand the spiritual battle a little bit more. So God's table is prepared uh, before our enemies. Point number three is Satan's table. I want to talk a little bit about Satan's table as well. God has a table, and God wants us all to be experiencing life from the table of God. Satan has a table as well, and uh, Satan is a defeated foe, Satan is a loser, Satan has been defeated at the cross, and he cannot get to the table of God. So I don't picture Satan sitting down with you and God at your table, But rather, I see another table, and I see a table that uh, Satan sets. He has his table as well, and and we are here caught between these uh, two tables. Satan is a liar. He's a thief, and he comes with all kinds of lies. He's the father of lies. He lies to us over and over again. 
no one loves me, everyone's against me, I don't have what it takes, I'm not good enough, and on and on. Satan's lies are endless because he's the father of lies. And he has a table filled with lust and sin and worldliness and pleasures of sin. We, we looked at our Sunday school lesson and how Judah fell into uh, idolatry and far away from God. And that uh, tendency is there for us as well because Satan has a table set. The devil is a roaring lion and uh, also comes as an angel of light. So he is uh, this picture of a roaring lion, just vicious and coming in full force. And then he comes also as an angel of light in deception. And he comes in ways that are just look right and feel right and seem so right and that's what Judah fell into he came as an angel of light and deceived them so we have many false teachings uh, that are coming across the pulpits today and all kinds of ways that the devil is coming as an angel of light and so he sets up this table, and I trust that you all can relate to temptation at this table. We're tempted to just sit down a little bit and just take a couple sips at the table of Satan and trying to, to eat from the table of God and the table of devils. And Paul says you can't do that. You can't eat from the table of God and the table of devils because you will lose your relationship with God. So you can't live both lives. And so let's be uh, aware of Satan's table and uh, be strong to be able to stay away from Satan's tables and all the things that he offers the church today. Do not sit down at Satan's table but God has a table for you, and he's longing for you to have a relationship with him. He's longing for you to experience his life and experience life at the table of God. Point number four, God has a table in heaven. And we're going to shift gears a little bit here now, and uh, we're going to look forward. And I love this part. The best is yet to come. And I love to think about the table of God in heaven and what God has in store for us in the future for those that love God and what that uh, great banquet hall will look like on this table where the whole church will sit down together. I don't uh, see this as a table for two, but rather a great banquet hall is being prepared in heaven. Psalm 23, David said, I will dwell in the house. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So what comes to your mind now? Anybody see this as it is in the scripture? Or, or what, what do you see when you think about the table of God in heaven? John 14, 1 to 3, Jesus said, don't let your heart not be troubled and neither let it be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So Jesus said, don't be afraid, don't be troubled, don't lose faith. I'm going to prepare a place. And if I'm going to prepare a place, I'm coming again, that you can be where I am. In Revelation 19, 6 to 7, we have the great account of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, that's worthwhile reading often. Revelation 19, the whole chapter. The great whore is destroyed and her smoke goes up before the throne forever. The false church is destroyed. 
And the church in heaven is ready to rejoice. The marriage supper of the Lamb has come. And the bride hath made herself ready. <coughs> Woo! <laughs> that will be a day. That will be an experience. That is coming. And that gets me excited. I want to be there. Ephesians 1.10, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. So there is a, in the fullness of time, he will gather together in one, all in Christ will gather together. Those in heaven, I believe, will come down and be resurrected, come up out of the graves <coughs> And uh, those which are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The great reunion together, where the church gathers together. Now, the church will recline at uh, the table of God. Luke chapter 12, I want to uh, look at a few verses here in Luke chapter 12. Thirty-five to thirty-seven. It says, "And let your lo loins be girded about, and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord, when He will return from the wedding, that when He cometh and knocketh, they may open unto Him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when He cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that He shall gird Himself and make." Them sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Now, this is also referring to the wedding. Those that are waiting when the Lord comes and watching. Those that are watching and awake and ready and alert, spiritually in tune. I believe those that are watching will be spiritually in tune. They're not going to be out in the world. They're not going to be going back to, the, to uh, sin again, but rather ready when the Lord comes. It says that uh, he will find them watching. He'll gird himself. The Lord Jesus himself will gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. So the Lord himself will serve the church. So here I see the picture of all sitting down at the table. I could be totally wrong when I get there, but I'll, I'm just going by what I see. The Lord's going to serve. Maybe it will not be all at one time, I don't know, but I would love that experience of everyone sitting down together. And the Lord girding himself and beginning to, beginning to uh, serve those that he died and saved and redeemed. I'm so humbled when I read this to think about sitting down at the table of God and Jesus himself girding himself and coming and serving. And just giving me food and giving me drink and, and just enjoy life together around the table of God. But I believe that that's what <clears throat> it says here will happen. We'll sit down around the table of God. And whatever that looks like, that's what God wants for each of us. We have to experience life at the table of God now if we want to experience life at the table of God in the future. We can't be sitting down at the devil's table and living life at the devil's table and, and be caught in a world of sin and the church growing so cold and so far from God and yet hanging on to this hope that we can all sit down in that situation. No. It is those that are washed in the blood of the Lamb and those that are, are repenting of their sins and those that are turning their back to the world and sin and 
those that are, are in tune with God today, experiencing life at the table of God today. It matters what for music we listen to. It matters what for videos we're watching. It matters the friends that we hang out with. It matters the words that we say. All of these things matter. Let's not be deceived in thinking that we can live lives far from God and still experience life in the table of God, sitting down at the table of God. When we sit down at the table of God, he's going to restore our souls. And if you're caught in things like that, I know today the church at large is in trouble. And I'm not too happy with the condition of the church as a whole. And we talk about the Jewish, the patterns of the Jewish nation. And I see the same thing happening to the Gentile church today. I'm not talking about our own church. I'm talking about the church at large. It's safe to do that. But I believe it is good for us to examine our hearts and lives today. We can get used to a lot of things that uh, we permit that are far from God. And think <clears throat> that we can listen to rock and roll music and watch videos filled with all kinds of trash and garbage and do a lot of those things and just get used to them. It's what we do, right? No. We, we turn our backs from that kind of a life. <clears throat> and so I want to call each of you this morning to Sit down at God's table, experience life at God's table, examine your hearts and lives like we heard about in our Sunday school lesson, the example of Judah, and then uh, come to God's table. It is prepared for everyone today, and the great invitation is for all to come. If anyone is thirsty, come to the water. If anyone is far from God, and your life needs restoration, come to the shepherd and come to the Lord. The invitation is for all to come. Just turn, as Isaiah said, repent, and though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow, I'll wash them clean. That is the call for today. Your enemies, <clears throat> and God's enemies are not taken away. If you have an enemy in your life or someone that's opposing you or working against you in, in any way, God has a table there for you. And he sets this table right in the presence of our enemies. Satan has a table as well. Let's avoid Satan's table and guard against uh, a life lived at Satan's table. And then lastly, the marriage supper of the Lamb <clears throat> is being prepared. The Lord has gone to, to prepare uh, a place. The great banquet hall is, is being prepared, and his bride is getting herself ready as well. So let's look forward with anticipation to this great time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. I thank you for the word of God and the table of God that uh, we looked at in scripture and how David said, you prepared a table in the presence of mine enemies. <clears throat> and I pray that each one here this morning could experience life at the table of God. Lord, uh, we love you and we thank you for your word. Go with us. As we uh, part, we pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's.